the latest wave of nausea passed, but the pain was getting worse. The drugs the medic had administered him left barely any sensation in his limbs, but the pain gnawing at his core was relentless. Made all the worse by the sound of the fly, Strange the creature could have found its way in here. Its insatiable buzzing was a constant presence. He had not yet been able to see the creature, his head still strapped to the gurney on which he had been restrained. Battle trauma, they'd said. At least his restrained condition stopped the spots from blazing across his vision. They burned, searing temporary scars across his retinas before disappearing again. Must have taken a blow to the head sometime. The adrenaline in those moments of war, survival instincts numbing the sensation of lesser injuries. That fly. Its incessant droning filled his ears as he closed his eyes. Wave after wave of the misshapen monstrosities had assaulted their sodden trench line. Victims of the zombie plague sweeping the planet, Sergeant Horitz had said. Something of the people they had once been could be determined by their clothing and the tone of their skin, both now stretched to the point of splitting by the swelling of diseased tissues beneath, features twisted beyond recognition. The guard had held the muckfilled trench line against the swarms of these abominations, relying on training drilled in on the instruction fields they had repelled the seemingly endless zombie horde. He had even seen a cursed plague marine finally taken down by well-coordinated focused fire. Its resilience under the barrage had been immense. It was in this moment of celebration his unseen assailant had struck. Its body ruined from the waist down, the undying abomination had dragged itself through the mud and down into the trench trailing its tangled entrails behind it through the oozing filth. Grasping at his ankles, it had knocked him off balance as his footing slipped away in the foul mud. Vile, stinking flesh slothed away from the fingers grasping at his throat, its blackened teeth snapping at him from a rictus grin, the fingers clawing at his rebreather as he fought desperately to keep its champing fetid teeth from his face. The distinctive bark of a bolt pistol shot tore through the trench, Fired at point-blank range, the monstrosity's head was jerked violently to the left, as what remained of its brain matter erupted from its shattered skull. The weight of it suddenly freed from him and he was hauled to his feet. Not today, Private, and the Commissar was already pushing down the line. Not today, he muttered as he composed himself to engage the enemy again. Not today. He jerks back from his reverie, noticing the abrupt absence of the flies droning chorus. The quiet seems almost oppressive, and in it he could feel the gnawing blackness inside, each cell bursting and infecting its neighbours, along arteries from his lungs, his own lifeblood spreading the corruption further. There was nothing he could do to combat the filth that had been unleashed in him, if only there was some relief from this pestilence some way to endure. Greetings friends and welcome to the Imperium's Most Wanted. I'm Lorcan, and this is Only War. At the head of his cursed plague fleet, he spearheads the forces assailing the Charidon system. Known as the Traveller amongst some of his benighted brethren, he seeks to gain further favour with his pustulant patron by adding to the long list of misery his corrupted atrocities have afflicted upon humanity. Once a celebrated Astartes and hero of the Great Crusade, now the most blessed of the Lord of Decay and the host of the Destroyer Plague, he is Typhus, the Herald of Nurgle. Although countless mortal beings have fallen to the Grand Shire of Pestilence across the galaxy, it can be surmised that one of which he is most proud is the corruption of Mortarion and his sons. Now twisted beyond measure, their noble heritance made unrecognisable by the many gifts bestowed upon them since their allegiance to their generous deity, the Heretic Astartes chapter known as the Death Guard. And in the fall of this legion from the light of the Emperor, the role of the man once known as Callus Typhon cannot be understated. Callus Typhon was a native of Barbarus, adopted homeworld of the Reaper of Men, the Primarch Mortarian, and the 14th Legion, soon to be known as the Death Guard. 
The planet of Barbarous was a death world orbiting a dim yellow sun. A thick toxic miasma of chemicals forms noxious clouds that blankets its atmosphere and leaves the land below a near constant shadow. This feral world was an unforgiving environment. All native life upon it was ugly and venomous, from the simplest lichen to the hook-toothed lamprey serpents that writhe beneath the surface of the murky earth. The very air itself in the highest reaches are burnt orange-black bled toxins into everything. Gases vented by the tectonic movements of the planet were excited by radiation from a sun seen only rarely as a dim yellow smudge in the high heavens. The clouds frequently wept acidic rain which poisoned the soil and the waterways even further. When humans settled Barbarous during the Dark Age of Technology, they found only the lower atmospheres of the moorlands and valley basins to be breathable. The volatile toxins raising through the atmosphere making the higher altitudes unlivable. Even with the technology of that age, life on Barbarous was fraught with danger, and when the Age of Strife came, the population quickly devolved into a pre-feudal state under such harsh conditions. During this time, malevolent beings immune to the toxins of the planet's higher atmospheres took occupancy in great fortress keeps high in the mountains. From there, they preyed on the humans below, toying with the lives of those these overlords saw as lesser. Contradictory accounts exist about the origins of these beings. Some suggest that the overlords had come from another place and taken up residence on Barbarous, inflicting their callous rule upon the humans they found there. There are hints that they may once have been human, or at least abhuman, until a change had been wrought upon them in the wake of a cataclysmic pact with a monstrous unknown power. If they had ever shared any kinship with humans, that history had been seared away long ago and forgotten. Little is known about Callus Typhon's earliest years as a child upon the toxic planet of Barbarous. However, the nature of his conception was not in doubt. The captured overlord Volkroll calls him a half-breed, claiming the curdled stink of lesser meat fouling and diluting the strength of overlord potential within Typhus. Regardless of whether the overlords of Barbarous were abhuman or Xenos in origin, before the taint of the warp twisted them further, it was known for them to occasionally indulge in their baser instincts, and produce children with the humans who cowered under their oppression. Callus Typhon was a child born of one of these indulgences, his mother taken forcibly having drawn the attention of one of the foul beings. He was visibly a half-breed, and suffered from that prejudice. Many looked in Typhon's dark eyes and saw only the bastard child of an overlord, but it was not just his outward appearance that gave away his heritage. The overlords were psychic beings, and Callus Typhon was troubled by nightly phenomena over which he believed he had no control. He displayed telekinetic powers, causing objects to shatter or be hurled across the room whenever he was frightened or angered. Plants would also wither and die under his gaze. From an early age, he tried to suppress these abilities that marked him out as other. Despite these efforts, the suspicion and animosity of the villagers would never be abated, and his mother was drowned by a mob as punishment for bringing him into the world. Callus would have also perished the same way had he not escaped the mob and began his life as an outcast among them. The unknown nature of these powers would further ostracize him amongst the humans on Barbarous, but he resolved to turn them to his advantage. By the time Typhon reached maturity, he had learned to master the psychic energies that resonated within him each night, becoming stronger in his resolve to succeed than most of his peers. Through fate, or possibly nefarious design, it was Callus Typhon who was first encountered by Mortarion, the Primarch having been discovered and effectively held prisoner by the most powerful overlord on Barbarous, a being known as Nakair, who had abusively forced Mortarion into situations that would test his Primarch abilities to the limit. Mortarion witnessed a detonation in a convoy bringing human subjects to Nakair's flesh works, and then a youth, stocky and fox-faced, scrambling from the wreckage and attempting to free other captives. Revealing his psychic powers, the youth conjured the skinny white lampreys that are native to Barbarous to burst out of the ground and savage the automatons. About to be overrun, he appeals to Mortarion for aid, and the Primarch breaks the bonds that have tied him to his master. 
Callus later reveals he was told by voices that Mortarion would help him, and persuades the Primarch not to sacrifice his life awaiting punishment for his act of kindness. Despite the grey and hopeless cast of their lot, Mortarion admired their great endurance, and understood their shimmering resentment towards their cruel masters. But to Callus, they would always be the people who had rejected him through the nature of his birth alone. Callus Typhon would stay by Martarian's side for most of the next eight solar years, wearing armour emblazoned with the glaring skull and six-pointed star, said to represent the shadow of death and the light of the new dawn freedom would bring to Barbarus. Those so marked were Martarian's death guard, his unbroken blades in the war against the overlords. Under Mortarian's guidance, the Death Guard had become an unstoppable force on Barbarus, and in turn, they had spread the war maker skills to every human settlement, so that every town was now a fortress. In another portent of things to come, his second in command and trusted friend had gone into the footholds to chase down a minor overlord months ago, and had made no attempts to contact his commander. While he still outwardly suppressed his psychic potential, Typhon was already looking to turn the pragmatism of Mortarion to consider the potential powers harnessing the warp could bring to their ends. Typhon claims he knows the overlords warp their underlings with dark power. It is here too that Typhon speaks to Volkral, the minor overlord that is his captive. Hoping to learn more of the overlords powers, the warp touched entity instead reveals something about Typhon. It is already in you, the octet, the grandsire's boon, coursing through your blood. I can sense it. Mortarion refuses to allow the use of eldritch powers of the overlords against them. Instead, his training for his elite warriors includes months of forced exposure to the killing clouds at lower altitudes, enough to strengthen their resilience and build stamina. He turns his mind and the talents of the blacksmiths and artisans of Barbarus to production of protective devices against the toxic environments the overlords call home, but still his assault with his human followers on the last citadel fails. Callus Typhon sympathises with Mortarion for his reaction to the arrival of the Emperor and his promises of salvation to the populace of Barbarus. He is present at the first meeting between the Emperor and his son, gaining a lingering look an interesting proposition, if, as we believe, he was already tainted. Mortarion rejects the Emperor's offer of aid in the defeat of the Overlord, and states his loyalty to Barbarus, his Death Guard, and them achieving their purpose unaided, but he agrees to bend the knee if he fails. When Mortarion is overcome by the toxic miasma surrounding his foster father, the Emperor intervenes to save his son. In honouring his oath, Mortarion is reunited with his gene sons, and he renames them in honour of his warriors from Barbarus. The Death Guard Legion is born. Callus Typhon would have been too old to become a true Astartes, and his genetic makeup might have caused significant issues for the process of gene seed implementation. It is more likely he received genetic and biochemical enhancements to increase his physical abilities to closer to the level of an Astartes. This might go some way to explaining how a potential Xenos-human hybrid could indeed become a space marine. While in modern times the recruitment process is far more exacting, in the days of the Great Crusades, legions needed many more recruits, so were much less discriminating in their candidates. Despite suppressing his psychic ability, his iron will and endurance allowed him to excel in the most brutal trials to become one of the first Astartes of the newly formed Death Guard the 14th Legion. It would not take long for his exceptional levels of fortitude and strength to be noticed among the Death Guard, who valued these traits above all others. He was soon promoted to first captain, and Mortarion relied upon him not only for tactical advice, but also for personal counsel, as the Reaper's nature and countenance meant he struggled to connect widely with the brothers of the Legion. When the Death Guard set forth with their stoic approach to the missions of the Great Crusade, the first captain was always there, Mortarion's strong right arm, his confidant and trusted comrade, despite his possession of the psychic powers his gene sire despised. Despite Typhon continuing to use his steel will to outwardly suppress harnessing the powers of the warp, his preternatural toughness was starting to raise questions no matter how heroic the act. His ability to shrug off injury became a whispered legend amongst his brothers. 
At some point during the crusade, however, Typhon started his descent down the path he may have had whispered to him since the day of his birth, a path that would lead not only to his fall, but also to that of his Primarch and nearly his entire legion. According to Typhon himself, he was secretly converted to the worship of the Chaos Gods during the Zaramund campaign, receiving first a revelation from the touch of an old crone when leading the Death Guard contingent in that joint action of lunar wolves led by Horus and dark angels led by Luther. It was also during this campaign that Erebus, the foremost chaplain of the world bearers, most likely inducted Typhon in the secrets of the Seven Pillared Lodge, one of the warrior lodges that had begun to spread throughout the Astartes legions in the later days of the campaign. When Mortarion joined Horus in his rebellion, Typhon helped orchestrate the virus bombing massacre of the loyalist elements in the traitor legions on Istvan III. Typhon had been unable to have battle captain Nathaniel Garrow join his loyalist comrades on the surface, so detailed him to the frigate Eisenstein, along with commander Ignatius Grolgor, privately ordering Grolgor to deal with Garrow and his men when necessary. The failure and slaying of Grolgor led to Garrow's escape. After the events in the Istvan system, Typhon led half the Death Guard in a splinter fleet, while Mortarion himself took command of the other. This separation of their forces would continue until late in the heresy. During his independent campaign of misery and misdirection, he clashed repeatedly with the Dark Angels. Typhon's fleet attempted to acquire the Tukulcha, an ancient sentient device of unforeseen power, in fulfilment of Nurgle's designs, but was foiled by Lionel Johnson during the Battle of Perditus. When Typhon encounters Mortarion again, it is on the planet of Yynx. Mortarion is puzzled at being sent to exterminate the population of a manufacturing world with little apparent strategic value. He is suspicious that Horus has become a pawn of the warp entities he still despises, and he loathes his brother Primarchs for having made pacts with these foul entities. However, despite struggling to overcome his contempt, Mortarion has sought the hidden knowledge of the warp on the planet of Herathleon. When a demon manifests through what he believed to be a captured human woman called Lamentia, Mortarion is forced to use the powers of the warp to repel the Mantis Crone's true demon form. He is also brought to the planet a creature resurrected by his own hand from the man who was once Ignatus Grolgor. However, Mortarion is still reluctant to use the demonic entity that is now bound to and inhabits Grolgor, despite having the power to make living matter blight and wither with just its passing. It is at the heart of the planet's primary spire that Mortarion and Typhon are reunited. The reunion leads to Typhon attempting to strike a brotherly tone with his Primarch. However, this Typhon is much changed already by his journey towards the embrace of Nurgle. Despite him being able to sense Mortarion's tentative explorations in the Immaterium, he's still aware of the reluctance his gene sire gives to the thought of knowingly harnessing the powers he so abhors. In an effort to unify the Death Guard and heal any rifts with Typhon's splinter fleet, Mortarion allows himself to be convinced to travel aboard Typhon's ship, the Terminus Est, for the final assault on Terra itself. Upon entering the Immaterium, the Terminus Est is besieged by a psychic assault that kills most of the human crew. Even Mortarion is overcome briefly, choking as he is haunted by visions of his youth on Barbarus and the trials of his adopted father, Nakair. Suspicion falls upon the unaffected Typhon, however he is able to deflect attention away, claiming it's just a peculiarity of the warp, but Mortarion rejects the notion of a phantom malaise that could strike the indomitable constitution of his death guard, and indeed himself, and he tasks his first captain to find the answers, to which Callus agrees with the aid of his specialist psychic brothers. At this point, while looking into the steady gaze of his once closest ally, Mortarion once again considers a question that had plagued him for a very long time. This man is his battle brother, his first friend and fellow outcast. There is a bond between them that goes deeper than master and warrior. It is a comradeship of exiles, but in him lies a poison that Mortarion loathes and abhors. Typhon then reveals he has discovered a conspiracy amongst the telepathic navigators of the Terminus X. 
Using planted evidence in the form of psionic glyphs, encoded hololithic diamonds containing communique from Terran's regent, Malkador the Sigilite, Typhon claims they have orders to ignore whatever course the Death Guard give them, and take them instead to the Fulcurian Moor, a supermassive black hole from which they would never escape. Typhon gives the order for his Grave Wardens to kill the captive navigators, an action coordinated and repeated throughout the fleet. Despite the fury the Reaper of Men has for his first captain acting without his approval, and the dire consequences, Mortarion is left with little choice but to acquiesce to Typhon's use of sorcery, with their armada becalmed in the warp. It is here that Typhon confronts Mortarion with the truths he has turned a blind eye to within his own legion. You don't want to hear me say this, but know the truth of my words. They have always been psychers within the ranks of the Death Guard, brother. Even before the Edict of Nikea suspended them from active service in the Legions, you kept them out of our ranks. Or so it seemed. I kept the gifted out of your way, taught them to hide their talents. A handful, out of a legion of hundreds of thousands. Surely you knew. Surely you wondered what they were for. And now they play their part. Now is their time to serve in our deliverance. He claims the Legion will be rewarded with what they have always craved, to be eternally strong, unstoppable, undying, to expunge all trace of weakness from themselves forever. Mortarion is later forced to attempt to dispatch a reanimated Death Guard by the name of Zarik. His horrifying decay and undeath put the lie to the resilience of his Death Guard. With the Chimeric Infection Mortarion names the Destroyer Plague, Occurring all over the fleet, he tasks his first captain and his psychers to return the ships to the material realm. In the navigator's sanctum of the Terminus Esk, Callus Typhon defies his gene sire and seals his fate. As the two groups of bodyguards clash, between them the Primarch and his captain stalk each other, trading testing blows that quickly escalate in tempo and lethality. Despite the years they had known each other, Mortarion and Typhon had never fought not even in sparring pits, but as the clash unfolded, Mortarion found the unpalatable truth rising to the surface of his thoughts. He did not know this man at all. He saw now a stranger behind those familiar eyes. Everything he knew about Typhon crumbled in that moment. The same changes that had consumed Grolgor were at work. The man who was truly callous Typhon, who had been a scared outcast youth, fiery rebel, and then a trusted commander in his army of liberation, no longer existed. Mortarion delivers the blow that ends the mortal life of his first captain, the crescent blade of his great war scythe tearing Typhon's chest armour and through it the scream of ruptured ceramite, a yawning wound finding both his hearts and slicing them open. But Typhon does not die, and he is able to ensure Mortarion is wounded in the throat, with a brass dagger Typhon had wielded as a youth all those years ago on Barbarus. The wounding makes Mortarion more desperate, and in an attempt to fight fire with fire, he resorts to the weapon he has so far hesitated to unleash, the entity now sporting the visage of Inatha Skrolgor, the Eater of Life. It appears the demon entity is obeying his oath to Mortarion as it envelops and crushes Typhon's undead form. But the timbre and cadence of Typhon's dying exhalations change, the death rattle shifts, and becomes a spiteful laughter. Stating that callous Typhon dies today, the Eater of Life spread its arms wide, tipping back its neck to expose the wide, pestilent mass of its goiter-bloated throat, which Typhon tore open with his bare hands, ripping it away. Through the gash he made, a stream of black, screaming bodies, a hurricane swarm of shining flies. The coiled clouds of the swarm breaking apart and diving upon the survivors of the Death Shroud and Typhon's Grave Wardens, attacking both sides alike. Feasting on them, they whirled around Typhon in a stream of dark blurs before diving into him, plunging through the great wound Mortarion's scythe had left in the first captain. Typhon's body twitched, writhed, and distended to accommodate the transformation eating him from the inside out. His back swelled amidst the crackle of fracturing bone and ceramite, 
and dense flutes of fissured bone burst out, each one spitting clouds of flies as smoke would belch from a chimney. Where his battle armour ended and the putrid meat of his flesh began was impossible to see. Finally, with a repellent crunch of breaking cartilage, a twisted horn grew from the first captain's swollen face. With each indrawn breath and exhalation, the droning of the flies inside him could be heard. He had become a hive for the things, a living nest for the destroyer plague. Callus Typhon was gone. Typhus, the herald of Nurgle, was born. Typhon had never made a secret of his origins. The bastard child was marked by the blood of his progenitor, just as Mortarion was marked by his. That darkness had always been made to serve the Death Guard Legion, or so Mortarion had allowed himself to believe. Here and now, the light of events had harshly exposed that lie. Perhaps the reality was that Typhon had always been leading them towards this point. The warrior who had once been his closest friend and ally was changed forever. Or perhaps it was more truthful to say that everything false about the first captain had been stripped away and revealing the true core of his being. The non-dead monster Typhus, reborn through unity with the powers of the warp, was what his old comrade was always destined to be. Mortarion was to blame for exposing his sons to the insidious power that Typhus had been courting his entire life. Typhon would now forever be the Undying Typhus, the host of the Destroyer Plague, suspended by dark sorcery in a place between decay and disease and a new bloom of life. He was the embodiment of the Death Guard ideal indestructible and ever enduring, Mortarion would similarly fall and take the rest of the Death Guard with him. Fully corrupted by chaos, Typhon and the rest of the Death Guard went on to join Horus for the final siege of Terra. On Terra, the Death Guard fought not only with their usual brutality, but also wielding many gifts from their new patron. Although the heresy was eventually defeated, the traitor legions claimed by the Chaos Gods were changed forever. After the Warmaster was slain, the traitor legionaries fled Terra and burned their way across the Segmentum Solar towards the Eye of Terra. They were pursued by those legions still loyal to the Emperor, as the retributive war known to Imperial scholars as the Great Scouring blazed across the stars, and the traitor legions made new homes within the trackless reaches of the Eye. His loyalty to Nurgle absolute, and knowing his patron waxed strong when mortals feared death. Typhus was not content with a sedatory existence as his Primarch's right hand, while he sentimentally recreated Barbarus on his own plague planet. Instead, he marshaled those whose bitter enmity towards the Imperium still burned most fiercely, and forming a plague fleet around the Terminus Esk, he took to the tides of the warp once more. Typhus has travelled far throughout the galaxy, guiding the Terminus Esk to spread the Lord of Decay's many gifts. It is believed he has even travelled through the Immaterium to the Garden of Nurgle itself. Guided here by a humanoid emissary composed of his own destroyer demon flies, he was able to lull the sentient fungus with his deep voice, and bewitched its guardians with tales of entropy and despair visited upon the mortal realm. When the Crimson Legions of the Blood God Khorne invaded the Garden and cut down every living thing they could find, it was Typhus who marshalled the defence and led the final charge of buzzing plague drones and slug-like beasts. At the climax of the battle, Typhus overcame the Cornite demon prince that led the Blood God's legions, slowly but surely crippling the dog-headed monstrosity with ever more virulent plagues until he was able to best him in single combat and take his guts as a prize for Nurgle's cauldron. Such was the resultant favour of the Lord of Decay that Typhon was allowed to reach the throne of Nurgle itself, presenting his offering before dipping his battle scythe Man Reaper into the filth that pooled around its base. Typhus has been tireless in his prosecution of his true master's goals. He unleashed Nurgle's rot upon unfortunate systems, turning billions of ailing souls into plague bearers that tirelessly catalogue the lesser diseases springing up in Typhus's wake. On Legiata, he loosed a plague song that forced the infected to chant a hymn to Nurgle even as they slowly wasted away. Yet the crowning glory of Typhus' achievements is the introduction of the zombie plague into the Segmentum Obscurus, 
The first incidents on Hydra Minoris led to 23 billion Imperial citizens being quarantined along with the infected of their planet and doomed to death. Wherever the plague fleet has been spotted since, the affliction spreads rapidly through the unfortunate system. With this terrible new curse, Typhon has fused the cycles of life and death together, for the zombie plague is a warp disease and can only affect those who have no faith or hope in their hearts. In the uncaring grind of imperial life, the majority of the human populace of many worlds can be counted amongst that number. Those that fall do not stay dead, however. Their bodies reanimated by the arcane infection, and they lurch after the living, desperate to feast upon warm living flesh. Even a single bite can transfer the infection to a new host, and so the process begins anew. In the 13th Black Crusade, Typhus's plague fleet was the first chaos force encountered by the Imperium, terrorizing the Agrippina system and overseeing the infection and desecration of many of the worlds to fall. Taking the Ulthor system for his own, he used a corrupted chaos artifact known as the Plague Heart to turn planets into demon worlds that he and his allies use as a stronghold to launch further incursions into, into Imperial space. One of these saw the Terminus Est leading an assault on the Dark Angel's fortress monastery, the Rock. Typhon had hoped to finally capture the Toluchula that he believed was the key to unlock the true potential of the Plague Heart, but instead the reunion of these artifacts along with a third, called the Ouroboros, led to a warp rift forming above the ruins of Caliban. Typhus was confronted by Chapter Master Azriel and Chief Librarian Ezekiel, engaging the Lord of the Rock in titanic single combat until the unfolding events caused the withdrawal of both sides. Despite having no remaining reverence or even respect for his gene sire, Typhus later appeared as part of Mortarion's armada during the Death Guard's invasion of Ultramar, leading again a splinter fleet which terrorized the outer regions. Now Typhus has risen again to plague the systems of the Imperium. At the behest of Abaddon, he is ready to spread vile pestilence through the Metallica system for the glory of the Plague Father. I hope you've enjoyed this look at Typhus, the Herald of Nurgle. If you have, please hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel for more 40k content. It makes such a huge difference when you do. Let me know in the comments if you have any suggestions for who you'd like to see covered next in the Imperium's Most Wanted. And I'll see you again, in the near future, where there is only war.